Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. You're very welcome along. Wednesday Night Rugby, Fiona Hayes, you're welcome back. Hello. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm great. Great. Keith Wood, Happy New Year and all that. Happy New Year, Joe. Uh, how are you getting on? Great, yeah. Really feels like a return to the grind talking to you two, I have to say. This is, <laughs> this is reality. Uh, yeah, we're uncomfortable at the best of times, I suppose. So um, <laughs> yeah, that's understandable. And we know you're a little bit sensitive as well, Joe. Well, listen, indeed. So uh, much going on, I suppose, and in other respects, nothing going on, which is part of the problem. We think, we think, we don't know. We're hopeful, I would say, is the best way of putting it, that Munster against Ulster goes ahead on Saturday at 7.35. Uh, just four games this weekend in the United Rugby Championship. For Leinster, their next game is in Europe. So Leinster at the moment have played about, is it, well, I think they've managed uh, no game in about 10 weeks, I think, or is it two games in 10 weeks? Something uh, appallingly small anyway so their next game is in Europe against Montpellier Sunday the 16th of January at 1 o'clock and then Bath the following week and then they have a game against uh, Cardiff on the 29th so I'm sure Andy Farrell is looking at Leinster and looking at Leinster players and saying please can we get some minutes into these players and then Connacht probably the least disrupted of everybody their next game in Europe uh, 15th of January against Lens against uh, Leicester in Europe obviously they lost away to Leicester last day out so that is where we are Keith I mean for Leinster in particular it's just been a case of trying to get a handle on a fairly rampant COVID situation. And like I said, next to no games over the last 10 weeks. Those three games in Europe, very, very important for Leinster, one, but certainly from an Irish perspective, too, I think. They are. I mean, it, it becomes it becomes difficult again to have these sort of conversations. And we had them last year and we had them the year before where where you're trying to keep an idea of what the hell is going on in the real world as opposed to in the rugby world and um, and how things are, are affected. So there's so many people seem to be struck down with COVID at the moment um, and that's having a huge impact in terms of people being sick, but for the most part, seemingly not as sick as they had been. Um, and to to a huge amount of people not being able to turn up at work at different places and different things and supply lines and uh, so like the world is in a in a kind of crazy state. Um, rugby is then trying to get their head around how do we stay afloat because I think we are almost at a point where if we had a protract, protracted period of time where people couldn't play um, couldn't play in front of large crowds. Um, that that would cause huge financial um, uh, disturbance to some of the, the the future of some of these clubs. So, and we also have the total um, um, disparity between five thousand people being allowed to go to a game in Ireland and seventy five thousand in the UK. So, um, it's um, it's it's a it's a very strange time. Uh, all the players that are going to turn up either for for Leinster or for any of the other provinces or for Ireland are going to do it in incredibly constrained circumstances. They will not have done all the training that they'll want to have done. They will not be up to full match pace all the time. And it comes down and almost entirely now to the depth of the squads that people have at their disposal to how they're able to get through a period of games and also the impact that COVID has on other teams. So you could be lucky, like I think Munster ultimately became very lucky playing against Wasps at, 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 the, at the end of the European, where they were able to play against a team that had were shorn of a load of players. When going into that game, it looked like Munster were definitely just going to have to turn up and nothing else, but they ended up getting a win out of it. So the circumstances change literally every 12 hours at this stage. So it's... Look, I think it's very hard, and I know I've said this, and it's it's. Look, we know we have to hold this um, with with a sense of common sense that this is a sport. It's a livelihood too, but it's also a sport, and it is important. But it isn't as important as some of the other things that are going on. Um, but it's very very difficult for the players, notwithstanding that, as to how they deal with everything else so they're dealing with everything that society deals with but they're also then having to be tested pretty much every single day um and it's so pervasive in in the community now that there is a risk hanging over every player every time they go for a test mm. for ulster's part and with a view to the game on saturday 
they've lost the games against Connacht and Leinster over the Christmas. They've had a COVID outbreak within their own squad. There were further positive cases last week and there are two rounds of testing planned for this week. So they've lost those two matches. There's talk of them having to play those matches during the Six Nations window because frankly pushing the URC final back isn't an option because the final is just two weeks before the summer test series people are starting to mumble about midweek matches maybe that doesn't seem very viable from a player welfare point of view you need two squads there really uh, Dan McFarland this week has limited training to small pods so he said in his most recent dispatch he was more hopeful of the game going ahead than he had been last week Fiona you're a stone's throw from Thomond is there any word down there what's the feeling yeah, no, I, I don't think there's much being said about uh, down there at the minute because everyone's so disappointed on the back of uh, last week. I suppose, look, you're you're hoping it's going to go ahead exactly what Keith said. I, I'd say it's an absolute nightmare to be a coach at the minute. Things are literally changing every 12 hours. They're constantly getting tested. Um, I think someone told me at the minute, maybe up uh, up in the north, that um, it's uh, one in fifteen that are are, are, are contracting COVID. So it, it's quite high. So I would imagine trying to keep the the squad in little pods and getting them training was exceptionally hard for Dan McFarland. But we definitely hope that uh, there is a game at the weekend because I think Munster really have a point to prove after the back of the last performance. Yeah, don't worry, we'll get to that. So on the Six Nations front, just to point Rob Baxter was making, Keith, you alluded to the fact that of the participating Six Nations, uh, five have restrictions on crowds currently. So in Ireland, for instance, the restrictions on crowds limited to 5,000 runs until the end of this month and then they'll have to see how things are. So we'll have to see what happens to the Viva Stadium on February the 5th when Wales come into town. Potentially, let's say that the peak is delayed and the restrictions are extended into February and beyond. Here's a quote from Rob Baxter. So he said, The whole beauty of the Six Nations has been the change of environment, the change of weather conditions, going to play in Scotland and Wales and Ireland. Those are the great challenges. That's what makes the Six Nations such a great competition. You've seen French teams that in one week they can beat anyone in the world in Paris and then the next week doesn't quite go so well in Cardiff. That is the beauty of the tournament. And from a rugby perspective, I'm sure that's what we all want to see happen. So far, so simple. That said, we can't all sit here and pretend the world is in an ideal place at the moment. He said, for the national bodies, their responsibility goes beyond professional sport. It goes right down to the grassroots rugby. So if playing the tournament provides a level of income that cancelling it or doing it behind closed doors doesn't create, then we've got to look at the next best case scenario. And so if the next best case scenario is playing all of the Six Nations in one country where you can have sellout crowds and raise revenue, then uh, that's got to be better than going without revenue or cancelling it. So Rob Baxter there. I think in a very genuine way, posing the possibility, let's play the whole Six Nations in England. And I know the Welsh are looking into the possibility of their home games at Wembley, because currently they won't be able to do it in front of crowds at Cardiff. So there's talk of going to Wembley. Is that such a ludicrous idea? Or would you 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 prefer to just say, well, we're sticking to Dublin for our three matches, 5,000 or no? Um, I think it's uh, like all these things come come across incredibly simple. If you just say, let's move it all over there, there is an impact uh, across everything. But if you just take it from an IRFU perspective, um, th- they need to measure and, and, and do a toss up between the amount of money that they would have to pay for a stadium, be it Twickenham or, um, uh, or Wembley, as example, and to what it would cost for them to have it in in uh, in Dublin in Lansdowne. Um, for me, I'd rather it was played against a, in a full stadium. I absolutely I agree with Baxter. Um, I, I think it's very difficult to. You can't guarantee that all the teams are going to be kept safe. That's it's just incredibly difficult for them. But in terms of pure financials, if I don't quite know, it isn't because there is a cost to playing in, the, in those uh, in those stadia. But if that could be done and could be manoeuvred, um, now the decision would need to be made very, very early. And I know that the RFU have been in full, full-blooded conversations with the government today for the fact that, that it is like a lot of the grassroots and all the money that's raised. So the, the international game, I think raises 83 or 4% 
of the income of Irish rugby. Correct. So, yeah. so if if that if that falls down where you have five thousand people in there, um, that's forty five thousand at a hundred quid as an example, four and a half million. That's for each game that you have. That's a huge amount of money that the IRFU cannot afford to be without. Mm. Now, funny on the day actually that the 62 signatories sent that letter to the Minister for Sport about their unhappiness with the RFU. On that same day, 19 million in taxpayers' money was handed over to the RFU. So you would think, even though um, I'm sure there's lots of people uh, listening who think, well, sport gets too much money in the first place, you would think whatever happens, the government and the taxpayer, and we'll all have to foot the bill eventually, will see the game right and won't let things completely run into disrepair. What about you, Fiona, though? Because Ireland are away to England and away to France anyway. So you're not giving up a major advantage against the two better teams. Would you uh, tolerate Ireland against Wales at Wembley in front of a full house as opposed to in front of 5,000 in Dublin if it came to it? I think Keith's right. I think it's full capacity stadiums. Everyone wants to see. The players want it, I'm sure. Um, When they're playing, there's nothing like the feeling of playing inside in that full that full stadium shouting and roaring and, and over in Wembley or wherever Ireland, if it, if it does go ahead, I'm sure there's a plan A, B, C and D at this minute. I, I'm, I'm sure they're looking at all different options. But if that was a possibility, I know there's a lot of Irish over, a lot of people would travel. So I think especially in this year, as you said, Joe, it's probably one of the better years to be playing the away games with uh, France and England away anyway. But obviously everything would love to be played in the Viva, those home games. But at the end of the day, it's revenue. And, and it needs to be brought in because we do want to be looking at maybe down, further down the line, you're looking at, I suppose it's going to affect everything really and maybe players getting contracts, players staying and playing in Ireland when it comes to it. All that money has to be created and probably we will only see the full effect of that in a couple of years. Yeah, true. One last COVID point and then I promise everyone it's a COVID-free zone. I can't believe we're back having these bloody conversations, by the way. But the Champions Cup in particular can count itself unlucky thus far with how things have gone. So their next two rounds are the weekend of January 14th and the weekend of January 21st. So thus far, from a Champions Cup point of view, we've had three pool matches cancelled and we've had five postponed with the view to playing those five again because non-essential travel between the UK and France was cancelled pre-Christmas. Now, the organisers are currently seeking assurances from authorities in France that matches in rounds three and four involving top 14 clubs can go ahead. They released a statement saying they're currently uh, working very hard with the various leagues and unions to try and get everything over the line. But it just feels a touch cursed at the moment, this tournament, when it comes to COVID. I would uh, think, Keith, they're already making very... Uh, strong contingency plans to scrap the round of 16 or certainly to scrap a leg of it or do something with the knockout stages to try and buy themselves a weekend this this, uh, this is a real struggle there's no room for this tournament at the moment for the, the troubles it's having No and, and they had made a call early on I mean they, they like uh, notwithstanding the difficulties right and you have to kind of put that in for, as a caveat to everything that you say um, the they're, they've had an ad hoc reaction to uh, to rulings and changing. So Leinster being awarded 28 points uh, um, to against them, um, to then the postponing of matches when they say there's no space to postpone, uh, to even the URC trying to postpone games for different things and trying to figure out where, where they do it. I think it's easier for the URC to be able to just say, well, we may just have to give those as 28 nil or even give them as two points each. Whatever way it works, you can make a decision to, to make it a bit easier. It won't be fair, but nothing is fair at the moment. Um, the European Cup, however, is all over the place because it's whether France would allow unvaccinated people into the country. And mm. um, uh, so that they've said they won't. So, um, so you're having cross country conversations with um and with a backdrop i think of brexit in there and there's a very anti-british sentiment in france in particular so a lot of the conversations that have been made at government level are tinged with um things well they're not in the european union so we have a different view for them and it's just it makes the whole thing is mired in in difficulty i think it's a difficult competition in a very good year and we haven't had a good year for three years and it's been, it's just incredibly difficult. So I don't know where they're going to be able to get it. Um, people would say, well, let's push out the season. There's no pushing out of the season. 
if one thing has, has come out of this, and we had this discussion last year, is that the season as it stands is already too full. There is no redundancy built in anywhere. So people are saying, well, there's a redundancy around the Six Nations. That's not a redundancy because yeah. a lot of the players are still playing. So there's too much rugby being on. There's, you're expecting perfection every single year to get all the matches played. So I just think it shows that a lot of the game is a little bit more broken than, than we thought it was. Mm. Okay, that's COVID discussion done in under... 12 minutes for the time being we'll be back happy, to it happy go lucky chat today Joe I have to say <laughs> what about global warming next let's get into that Keith so um, we're doomed ultimately there's no way back we have no faith in the politicians uh, rugby on off the ball is with thanks to Vodafone official sponsor of the Irish rugby team team of us everyone in let's talk Connacht 10 Munster 8 due credit to Connacht absolutely but I can sense Hayes sharpening knives there and it's Munster she wants to get stuck into. So how bad was this? Yeah, look I I, I, I need to take a pause and have a moment there Joe um, before I answer it and get my thoughts together I suppose from me just looking at it, was excited waiting for the game, you know the the other Interpro was cancelled, really thought it was going to be a, a spectacular game or rugby and it just didn't happen and especially from a, a Munster's point of view it, they didn't even shoot a shot, I mean it was just it was crazy to think I, I, I was talking to someone earlier and like Casey had, twen- had 24 passes, his stat was 24 passes and Marmy in 86. I mean, that's, that's, that says enough for me when you're looking at that. Every time the ball was kicked, kicked on and you had Haley running on, sometimes Ben Healy has dropped back to catch it. What happens? We kick it straight back, go for a drop goal, whatever. There was absolutely no counter attack and it was, it was just disappointing. There just didn't seem to be a game plan. And I, I definitely didn't know what they were trying to do because it didn't suit. They hadn't played like that in a long time. And it was just a very, very disappointing day for Munster Rugby, not taking away from the grit of Connacht, mm. but for Munster attacking wise, it was absolute shambles at times, I think. There was that point when Ben Healy attempted to drop goal from about 400 yards where you did think to yourself, what's going on here? Further to your passing statistic, Munster in total had 45 passes, Connacht had 170 passes. Like it wasn't the greatest evening for rugby, but Connacht still managed 170 passes. Ireland across November, interestingly, averaged 217 passes per game. So Munster were down at 45 passes in the entire, I don't know, 90 minutes of rugby or whatever it was. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like this just feels Fiona like Munster are walking eyes wide open into another dud of a season here that's what you would think I mean they, obviously there's disruption there at the minute with the, the coaching staff they don't um, they don't know we know they're gone at the end of the season delighted Roundtree has signed on for another two years I'm a big fan of him I mean I, I thought their the, their mall defence at times I know they scored off uh, off a mall Connacht but I thought their mall defence at times was excellent I thought you could see um you could see a lot of grit in defence from Munster at times but it's just that attacking platform it's you can't get anywhere in rugby these days unless you have an attacking platform. It's just the way the, the game is beautiful to watch now. Defences, yes, I, I, I love watching defence in action, but it's attacking rugby that wins games. And there is absolutely not a glimpse of it at the minute. Yeah. Keith, do you want to talk about the Munster attack, first of all, and that performance at the sports ground? Um, yeah, I, look, I, I feel we, we often, we labour the point with Munster too much. And I would want to give Connacht... Um, the proper credit <coughs> for the the way they played. I thought I thought it was a bad game of rugby, and um, but I thought at least Connacht looked like they wanted to play. Um, I thought Marmion looked like a class act. I thought if Carty had stayed on, um, um, I, I think Munster would have been beaten by twenty points um, because I think he'd have put over all those kicks. Gerald didn't look comfortable um, kicking the ball, nor did they look comfortable getting him to kick the ball. They just wanted us to, to go again. Um, uh, it's, the, the, there's no point talking about Munster's attack. That doesn't exist at the present moment in time. Um, and I think we're beginning to ruin some of the players, and I'm finding it incredibly hard to watch. 
Um, and if the coaches, like Fiona said, there's a bit of a disruption that's going and the coaches, well, I'd rather the coaches went, if that was the case, than stay and play that level of turgid nonsense. So um, uh, when I look at someone like uh, like Casey, who I, you know, I think he's been overhyped um, and I would definitely overhype him because he's unbelievably exciting and his ability to get to the ball and, and to flash the ball is a mark of what you want to have in the game. And the game changes and moves in cycles and it's moved again to a really, really fast paced game. And Munster are slowing it down more than everybody else is, is speeding it up. Mm. So Casey is now slowing down to get there. And I don't ever want to see that in his game. His game is... A small, he's a small nine. He is a nine that has to pick the ball the second it touches the ground and hit his 10 or hit a forward running onto it. But this constant slowing down, and I disagree with Fiona because you said we haven't seen this. Actually, we have seen it. We just haven't seen it so unbelievably lackluster. Um, and the lack of ambition before half time, the, the trying to pick and drive to get over when there was one man down and there was time and space on both sides and nothing happened. There was no thought process gone into it. So um, the things that I find frustrating still frustrates that mm. Munster are trying to play a style that if you have a huge pack of forwards, you can play uh, Monster don't have a huge pack of forwards. Slowing down the game is of no value. And you'd rather see guys play uh, a little bit with a bit of joy and not plod around the field. I I looked at, at, at Coombs, who I'm a huge fan of, and he... He just looked one paced. It just looked it looked like a slug fest. And I know it was a bad day, but that was that's an indictment. And I have to say that's an indictment on Van Gran. Um that he's not now able to get his players to play at pace because if that is what he expects the team to play at, nobody's happy with that. I would say they are about as damning comments as you've given me over the many years we've been talking on Munster Rugby. So we're in danger here of ruining some of the players. And reading between the lines here, I don't think you would be devastated if the powers that be at Munster said, do you know what? You're heading off at the end of the year. You're heading off at the end of the year. Let's just move on now. Well, what I would do, because you have to, you, you still have to have, you have to have players and coaches and people who can do different things. So, uh, like I was asked prior to Christmas about, you know, all the different guys that are being named and where you talk Raj or, or Paul O'Connell. And I think it's too early for Paul. Um, and it may be too early for Paul to be on a full-time role, but it may not be in a part-time role because we're at a point where we need, we I think we need enough of people that uh, are interested in the province um, to to put their shoulders to the wheel. And he is one of the coaches that's in there. I would say someone like Larkham, who is going at the end of the year, I'd say, Steve, there is an expectation that you can make players play if you're just given the temporary head coach role until the end, end of the season, can you make that happen? Can you see if you can change Monster into doing something that could excite a crowd? Um, and if, 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 um, and I like Van Gran, I get on fine with him, but um, his comment afterwards was that this is a game of um, a derby and was going to be very tough. Well, that's a lovely comment. If you show some effort, but there was no effort shown, really. No thinking went into that game. And like I look at the team and I look at a lot of the young guys who have got a chance. I'm a bit disappointed with the selection as well. I don't think we should be chopping and changing as much as, as we do. Um, and the idea of having to give players match time, no. Having to get the team to play properly is one of the most important things that's there at the moment. And I don't know that Munster are doing that. So... Look, I just think it's, it's, I think it's very hard. I think there's an awful lot of really good players there. And I, um, I don't think they are world beaters, but I think whatever new coach that we bring into Munster, that comes into Munster, they need to be a coach that look at the players that they have at their disposal and have to improve them and have to play a style that suits them. Because at the present moment in time, I don't know if either of those things are true. Hmm. Fiona, where are you and Van Gran? I don't want to misquote Keith, but I, I I interpret what Keith said there as they should think very seriously about bringing the Van Gran era to a close mid-season if somebody like Larkham says, do you know what, 
let me implement my ideas and see if we can shake things up for the next five months. Again, Keith, jump in if I'm misquoting you, but that's how I'm reading what you're saying, to bring the Van Gran era to an end. Where are you in that, Fiona? 100%. I mean, there's obviously questions going on in the background. You've contracts you don't you don't know. But I, I, I do believe it's very hard as a player, I would imagine, to play underneath a coach when you know they're, they've already signed. He's 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 terminated his contract as of he's not re-signing. He's had the option to re-sign. Mm. He's that, made that applies decision. to Larkham as well, we should say. True. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I like you're you're looking at I, I know there was a discussion earlier with someone you're looking at, at round three is it has put pen to paper. Is he head coach material? He wants to be a head coach. Should he get a shot? Maybe, you know, that's it's kind of stuff like that you're looking at. I suppose we I think there will be questions if this Ulster game goes ahead at the weekend and we see a similar performance. I think there will be massive questions around Van Grand staying on. Is it time to maybe move on? Obviously, he'll have to be paid out to the end of his contract. All that is understandable, but you've already decided to go. So it's maybe now time to look at there's We've seen Kazi, Kazi brought. I know he's head of academy. We saw a local coach. He brought over the lads over to Wasps. And yeah, it wasn't an absolutely exceptional game, but I think we saw glimpses of of, of really innovative rugby. We saw the guys wanting to play. The younger guys got a shot and there was no fear in how they're playing. I mean, I'm looking at that Munster team as well. And I mean, the discipline, in that match was absolutely crazy. They have to. They have to look at that. You're you're looking at what eighteen penalties. I mean, uh, he, he was really hard on the ref. Was really hard on players not rolling away out of the rock. We saw it earlier with Alton Delan, and yet they proceeded to do it every time they ca- tackled a lot. We were caught on the wrong side of the ball. Even the referee spoke, and we still didn't fix those errors. So you have to you have to wonder what's going on in, in inside in the mindset at times. When I know you're in the heat of a battle, mm. but but geez, I think it was even our a couple of times it was three times in a row he was caught on the wrong side I was I was wondering did he still have the old turkey from the Christmas dinner or what in him but I mean you just have to tighten up that side of the game and it wasn't pretty viewing at all To make uh, you know some mitigation here Keith on uh, Van Grand's part perfectly entitled to move on at the end of the season doesn't mean he's not going to be absolutely uh, loyal and invested in the job for the next five months and of course we'll want to do well I saw uh, Rowntree was saying that a lot of the work in the training ground just hasn't quite clicked for them yet. I mean, we were saying the same thing about Ireland and Andy Farrell a while back and then suddenly it does, it can happen. Someone like Mike Haley played, that was his first game in 11 weeks. They're in great shape in Europe. They could be looking at a home run in the knockout stages of Europe up to and including the semi-final. Connacht named a good side, Connacht are a good side and Munster, they've what, played three games since October. South African trip absolutely decimated them and their preparation. So, uh, you're, you know, you you generally very fair and have a lot, would accept all that mitigation. So, so what is it about what you're seeing here that just has you at the point of of doing what I have never heard you do before, which is call for a coach's head? Yeah, I, it's, look, he's gone. So, you know, he's going at the well, end of this with, with immediate effect, though. With immediate effect. Yeah. So, um, what, what I'm looking at is um, is a, a team that's going to play against Connacht and. Like we we can bypass anything that goes vaguely patronising about Connacht. Connacht are a very good side. Mm. They play incredibly well. They have they've started. It isn't scalps for them anymore. They're looking for the consistency of beating the teams. And they were they were bristling very heavily from from they should have beaten Munster and Thoman Park. And it was a referee decision at the end of the game, a, a wrong decision. Um, and they, uh, I think that they, again, they were on the wrong end. I thought Farrell um, should have had a red card as well. I thought that was an impact to the head. And um, so I think they could have feel, felt aggrieved with that. They are playing, um, and they're playing with, they're, they're playing, trying to win, not afraid of losing. And that's, when I look at Munster at the moment, it's almost, can you grind out the win? Mm. And, try, you know, but look, Fiona touched on it. The discipline was, was, was very poor. Um, the, the energy. And so what I'm trying to look at the at thing is, I don't know what's going on in, 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 in the, the coaching setup. I don't know what's going on in the training session. Um, but if that is the extent of the first big game around Christmas, and that that is the energy that's brought to it, something isn't right. Mm. Whatever that is, mm. it, whether it's because the players think that the coach is, is gone or the coach isn't able to get it across to it or not, um, there isn't going to be a wholesale change in players. That's just not going to happen. Um, 
uh, there's the rumor mill in that a lot of the, 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 the South African guys that had come over with him will go at the end of this year as well. I don't know whether that's true or not either. And in some respects, I hope it isn't. But um, I, it's, but you're just, you're looking at a game and you're saying, come on, yeah. think, show, play, do some, but go at pace. So I know it's a different league and a, a, a totally different setup, but I watched two days later in Quinn's play Gloucester and uh, watching Danny Kerr at 35 years of age playing at a pace that it's it, it's it's beggar's belief the pace he plays at mm. and uh, I watched it with one of my sons and he said I said look at him he's just slinging the ball he said he is slinging the ball but there's always somebody waiting for it yeah. there's already somebody with their hands up because they know the ball is going to be slung in that direction um, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure it crosses your mind Jerry Flannery looking on as well on the say so say to follow your point through for a second say they decide look you're moving on you're probably keeping an eye on Bath half the time anyway this is just not working out and you said the Larkham idea is there an argument though that okay Larkham goes in and really gets to uh, realise his vision which we hope is there I mean we're making assumptions here about Larkham I would say as well he's been there a long time and we're not quite seeing the fruits of it but say we say to Larkham in you go Straight away, we're into Six Nations. There's the disruption cause, but straight away, you're into Six Nations. And then you're into the business end of the season. And, there, you know, that, that style of rugby will take a little while to bed in. And, you know, there's an argument when you get to knock out rugby, maybe you go back to that more conservative plan. Sorry, anyway. there's, no argu- there's no argument for that, Joe. The, the, the manner in which Munster played um, at the weekend yeah. is the manner in which Munster have tried to play um, against Leinster over the last number of years, against Saracens in the years before that, which is to try and have a limited style to stay in the game. And it hasn't been good enough further down the line. Mm. It's now not good enough for a team that isn't at the top of the tree and Connacht are not at the top of the tree compared yeah. to Leinster and Saracens. So is that the least worst option is to lose? What, what's the line? You don't, if you lose, you don't look for consolation in the score. Mm. You know, it, it's like... They're, 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 it's, it's to, to keep to, 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 to keep, yeah to keep Van Gran on you're just going to sleepwalk into the same manner of defeat it's a conservative game plan it'll be picked well, off by a better team in Europe so we've seen that movie before let's not bother doing it again that's that's what you're saying to well me. that's that's that that is what I feel about yeah. it so yeah. the point the point would be then to Van Gran is are you willing to to throw out that slowing down the ball because that's what monster do they slow it down well he's not, well I think he's not I mean that's the, that's the conclusion that we've reached isn't yeah. it. Well that's, the, well, that's the point. And that's why there is always um, the benefit of the doubt in the pre- previous conversations. So because you're looking for a change and there are different circumstances that have happened. Um, uh, and, but we started to see young players come into the, into the system and um, they get a run, they do very well, and then we don't see them for three weeks. And that's not right. That's not right either. When a player plays well, he's he holds the jersey. There's nobody entitled to the jersey coming back. So when a guy does well in the jersey, you want him to stay in the jersey. So I just think, uh, for me, I just, I, was, I wasn't I was as excited as Fiona going into that game because that game has been a bit of a slugfest for the last number of years. Um, there's a bit of an edge to it and there was an edge to the game. Um, but I thought, yeah, well, we're going to see the metal of Monster, um, and that even though the Connacht have picked a good team, um, this is the this is the opportunity. Mm. But it's not an opportunity if you don't take any opportunity yeah. or pass yeah. the ball. And let's put that as the fundamental of the game. So you're calling for Monster to change the coach at this point of the season. Do you think they will change the thinking or change the coach? That's what I would be saying. Okay. So and do you, um, and, and say the thinking. Say they were to make an assumption that based on the last number of years the thinking won't change do you think they will change the coach mid-season I, I honestly don't, I don't know yeah. um, it, that's not something that normally happens but um, what we are looking for is we're looking at a lot of young monster players beginning to come into the system um, they need to be able to play but they also need to be able to grow in the game and um, and for me, I, I just feel that because, and it's, I said this earlier on, and the game moves in cycles. The one cycle that has never changed is the South African cycle, which is the huge forwards, a big carrying 12, 
and a couple of fast wingers, right? That has never changed. So they're the only ones who who ignore all the cycles that happen in the game. That's the manner in which they play and they play with a huge team with it. That style works if you have all those component parts, but it doesn't really work and especially doesn't work when the game has changed in the last 18 months in particular to become an awful lot faster, a lot more risk taking, uh, a lot a lot more opportunity for, for different things to happen. It doesn't always work, yeah. but we've seen it work in Connacht's history, actually, um, more recently than in Munster's history. So they've managed to win and win a trophy by playing a style and uh, with more limited um, uh, resources, by playing a style that just excites the hell out of everybody. No, it doesn't always work, and that has to change as well, and it does do. But we have seen it in Ireland that it has started to change when you put a structure in that leads decision making to be to be done, but fast decision making. We're just not seeing things fast at the moment. Yeah, and Fiona, we're not overestimating the quality of player Munster have here, are we? No, I, I think they've proven at times. I mean, we're we're well, I'm raving about Coombs and Casey all season and you know, just watching them even in that game, it was barely even saw Coombs involved and he he's definitely a guy that's on the up. And I just think that like as I said, that twenty four passes or as you yeah. said, Joe, forty five was it? Yeah. I mean if you're if you're an eight and you're not getting on the ball, if it's it was a bit of kick tennis at times, you know, it just it if you're an eight, you want to be seen, you want to be a big ball carrier. He's trying to get himself into that six nation squad that's going to be picked after uh, in the new year soon enough. So these games aren't doing anything at all for these young players coming through. Yeah. Okay. Well, and we can put that we can put that one more, Joe. Um, and not just to labour the point, but like there was a, a level, not from not from this uh, this parish, but there was a, a level of um, anger when there was no Munster player in one of the Irish teams that was picked in the autumn. Um, well, they're not being picked for a reason, you know. So, you know, there it's. Does that mean that all those players aren't good enough? Now, there's a good few of them sat on the bench and were able to deliver from the bench and they could and did really well. But are they not doing it for a reason? But, are you know, they want to be able to progress their game. And you cannot say that the match against Connacht was a progression in any way, shape or form. Sure. OK. Well, suddenly... Uh brings a whole new atmosphere to the game on Saturday. Fiona, will you go? And I, I presume like there's suddenly pressure on, on all concern now, isn't there? Absolutely, a lot of pressure. And I, I think I think a big performance is needed. And I really, really, I, I, I think they will get the win at the weekend. Um, I would imagine the players themselves aren't too happy. They would have had to have a, a hard look at themselves this week as well. Um, hopefully we'll see a, a game plan. And as Keith said, a more up tempo. That's what people want. I'm not sure is Zebo. We haven't seen Zebo. I know Haley has been playing well, but maybe we need to get someone with a bit of X factor like that in, you know, that gets, that gets, wants to get on the ball, wants to run the ball, wants to attack. We're just not seeing players want to attack. They are, they're happy to carry. They're happy to kick away. And hopefully we'll see a really big a big attacking game now on, on Saturday OK we'll talk next week I'm sure Keith Wood Fiona Hayes thanks very much Cheers lads Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone official sponsors of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us